Hello and welcome to Switzer Investing. I'm Peter Switzer. Thanks for joining us on tonight's show. We talked to Tim Fung. Now he's the CEO and founder of Airtasker that recently uh, listed on the Australian stock market. Really interesting business. I'm keen to see whether the future of this business is going to be really rosy, particularly when we get out of lockdown. Then we talked to the co-founder and chairman of a company that actually listed on Wednesday, Cobram Estate. Who hasn't tried Cobram Estate olive oil? This is a, a spectacular story, fantastic company. Listed, as I say, only on Wednesday. It's going to be very interesting to see how this company goes. It is not only the biggest producer of olive oil in Australia, it's becoming a, a big producer in the US of A, which is about 20 years behind us when it comes to the consumption of olive oil. And then we talked to Marcus Bogdan. Now, he is the uh, fund manager of my Switzer Dividend Growth Fund at a time when dividends are going through the roof. So I want to see what he thought about the CBA report uh, earlier this week, Telstra and Goodman Group. All those three stocks are actually in this fund of mine, Switzer Dividend Growth Fund. It'll be interesting to see what he thinks is going to happen to dividends and particularly the dividends for the Switzer Dividend Growth Fund as well. And then we talked to Charles Tarby and I'm going to ask him about the fact that some houses, particularly in Sydney, have been sold over a million dollars above the reserve. Now, does this say this market is even getting is hot? We know it's hot, but is it actually getting hotter? Um, his Charles's observations on, on the, the property market really can't be ignored. This is a guy who founded a Century 21 many years ago, and he has uh, agencies right across the country. So his view on what's going on in the property market is a really informed one. So that's the show. Let's kick off and meet Tim Fong of their task. Well, joining me now is the founder and CEO of Airtasker, Tim Fung. Tim, thanks for coming to the program. Peter, thanks for having me. Tim, just as kick off, a lot of people, maybe older people, don't know exactly what Airtasker does. And I, I remember it being explained to me maybe four or five years ago by a, 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 I was doing a speech and this other, this woman was doing a speech and she was talking about this new business called Airtasker and she really thought this was going to be a business of the future. And she kind of held it up to explain to people what digital disruption was going to mean for lots of industries. So Tim, explain to normal people what Airtasker does. So Airtasker is a uh, marketplace for local services. And in really simple terms, we connect people who need work done with people who want to work. Um, so I think at, at its very, very core, it's a very, very simple uh, business model and a very simple sort of value proposition to consumers and to service providers. Um, I think where Airtasker has done something that is a little bit different and, and potentially new is that uh, we look at services uh, at a very horizontal level. And what we mean by that is that rather than saying that there are fixed services, fixed verticals like plumbing and electrical and accounting, uh, rather, we look at it um, as consumer problems. So when you come to Airtasker, a customer can describe anything that they need done. And then we empower our taskers who have like, a huge range of skills to be able to solve that problem in any way that they see fit. And um, by opening up and creating that open marketplace, uh, we enable new industries to be created. So things like IKEA furniture assembly or things like um, you know, having a spider removed from your home are all services that can now be offered through a marketplace like Airtasker. Yeah, and it's funny. I, I think I look, I, I, I'm, I'm just looking at, for example, you were, when did you, you list on the, on the Australian Stock Exchange? Uh, we listed on the 23rd of March uh, this year. So it's been a, you know, a four-month journey so far. Okay, so you listed $1.75, a lot of enthusiasm, and it's now around not 97 cents right now. And I've kind of figured that lockdown wouldn't have been great for you, but Tell us the experience of Airtasker during lockdown. Because I know, for example, in Melbourne, they've got a 5K rule. So if I'm a person who's getting my work out of you and I can't drive out of the 5K, it could be a problem. But tell me, has lockdown been a good thing or a bad thing for the business? Well, maybe I can first start by uh, talking a little bit about the IPO figures that you quoted there. So we actually listed at a price of 65 cents. Um, and so we're currently at 97 um, so we're actually around 50% up on what our IPO uh, price uh, was. 
Yeah. Uh, in terms of the, the COVID uh, lockdown, so um, for sure what we've seen, what, what's been great um, is that over the last year and a half, we've been able to build up a lot of history of how COVID affects the air task and marketplace. Mm -hmm. And so we've seen these lockdowns coming on and off. And, and so we, we have some predictability in that. Uh, what we generally see is that at the very beginning of a lockdown, um, people, um, the, the marketplace activity is depressed because people are you know, going back into their, uh, into their homes. But then very quickly, the marketplace starts to adapt to what customers need during uh, the periods of lockdown. And taskers are very much, that they're our service providers, are very much empowered to be able to go and solve those problems in any way that they see fit. So whilst things like domestic cleaning tend to, to drop, we see other areas start to grow. So for example, um, home IT, with everybody working at home, uh, there's a huge demand for home IT services. Um, uh, virtual fitness training, uh, that's another area that um, is really, really growing uh, on Airtasker. Uh, COVID safe deliveries, uh, people need, you know, they don't want to move uh, out of their own home and they can't move from their own home, but they can engage uh, uh, um, people to be able to do those deliveries. So. Uh, we see a, a mix, but generally uh, the shape of the curve is an immediate sort of depression followed by an acceleration um, out of lockdowns. Yeah. Restrictions in terms of people coming into, into and onto a property, was that a problem, for, for in, in, at least when the restrictions become more severe? Well, the main uh, principle that we have on Airtasker is that everybody needs to be listening to the same information. And so what we've done is we've created a COVID safe, um, a COVID safety hub uh, on the Airtasker platform. And on every task that is completed through the platform, um, the taskers, the service providers, actually need to opt in to a checkbox, which says, I've um, assessed this against what the regulations are, and I'm certified to go and um, complete this job. So we're absolutely uh, focused on making sure that everyone's aware of the rules. Um, and we've um, created a way to bring all of that information together from the various uh, state and federal uh, legislation into, into one spot, so it's really clear. Okay. It seems to me, Tim, because I, I think it's a, it's a great idea, Airtasker, but it seems to me your, your biggest challenge is going to be to market it effectively to get people to understand, like, what you explained to me then, I didn't know that was going on. And if I hadn't asked the question and I hadn't watched a program where you came on and someone asked that question, you gave the answer, I would know that. So, I'll, I'll be, and obviously marketing is, is a costly experience for all, all companies. And, and of course, the, the more clever you are doing it, the, the less costly it can be. So what is the marketing plan for Airtasker? So uh, first of all, I'm excited to say that we've um, just brought on a, a CMO, a Chief Marketing Officer, at Airtasker, her name is uh, Noelle Kim, and she was previously the um, the head of marketing for Instagram um, across the Asia Pacific. So uh, we've got a great pedigree and great experience coming into the organization to help us exactly with, uh, with that. Um, but philosophically, uh, the way that we uh, think about Airtasker is that what we're doing is we're empowering service providers. We're empowering taskers to be able to make money from the skills that they, uh, that they have. And so we always look to our taskers as to how can we help them advocate and, and share more about Airtasker with, uh, with the world. Um, one of the uh, initiatives that we've recently launched is a thing called um, Airtasker Listings. And what it does, it flips Airtasker on its head so that taskers, service providers, can now prepackage up services and display them uh, within the Airtasker app. And so rather than the customers having to come and ask and think about what they need done, instead they can browse through what taskers can do for them. And so for example, in the case of our COVID safe deliveries, um, I saw that we had a you know, 100% spike in our COVID, sa uh, COVID safe deliveries uh, being done yesterday because now we've got taskers saying, I am authorized to go and do this. You have permission to buy that service from me. Um, so I would say when we think about marketing, we always come back to our community of taskers and think about how do we enable them, empower them uh, to be able to make the most money they can from their skills. Yeah. Uh, in terms of um, employees, how many employees do you have at this point in time? We have about 150 employees um, between um, two offices, or three offices, I should say, uh, here in uh, Sydney, uh, although we're all working from home at the moment, of course, um, in Kansas City, uh, in the US, we have a, a US team, 
um, and then a, a team uh, based in Manila as well, focused on uh, growth and operations. Yeah. So the the time you've spent um, in America is it a, a relatively short period of time. Yes, it is. So uh, we uh, we have been operating in the the UK uh, for uh, for a couple of years now, and that marketplace is now. Um, you know, very much in, in scaling mode, which is really, really exciting. Um, uh, but the US uh, market is something that we just kicked off this year. And we actually, the, the first move that we made was to acquire a company uh, called Zali, uh, which um, uh, is an awesome uh, open marketplace. Um, and that's how we actually brought on uh, Bo Fishback and his team of um, Zali marketplace experts uh, into the Airtasker team. But it's been uh, quite a recent uh, evolution. Okay. So therefore, the, the, you've effectively only just dipped your toe in the water in the US market. Um, what's your expectations of the take-up of Airtasker in the US? So when we launched Airtasker in Australia, if you look at the, the curve, it's pretty much the sort of definition of, of, a, of a J curve um, and a very late stage J curve where it took us quite a few years to build up to you know, even millions of dollars of, of marketplace turnover. Um, but in the last few years, it's it's really grown, and you know this year we're we've done more than 153 million dollars in in GMV, uh, predominantly in Australia. So it is a a back ended curve, and it's taken us about nine years to be able to build up to that um, up to that level. Um, so in the US and the UK, we're expecting this year to do around about 10 million dollars um, in annual run rate of GMV, and we've set that expectation uh, with the market, and so far we're well on our way to to doing that. Uh, but what we're trying to do is really compress up what took quite a few years to do in Australia, figure out the playbook for being able to compress that up into a very, very much a shorter period of time. Um, and, and so as much as this is about scaling, it's also about learning and building a playbook that allows us to do that in the shorter and shorter and shorter uh, period of time for each new city that we uh, expand into. Regulatory issues um, moving from Australia to the UK and now the US are there different regulatory issues that make it challenging growing in a different country? So I think regulatory issues are always something that is uh, important to you know prioritize and make sure that you're you're fully engaged with that. Um, our general philosophy on that is always to lean in with regulators, with unions, with associations, and actually try to align around uh, what the problem is that they're trying to solve with their regulation. So rather than fighting about the regulation itself, um, is to work together and align around what is the problem that we're trying to solve here. And what we've generally found that when we do that, is that we're all trying to do the same thing, which is create more jobs uh, for people in the economy, do it in a safe way, and make sure that people are getting paid a fair amount of money for the work that they do. And so actually, um, for us, working with regulators, working with associations, working with unions, is actually been a positive experience so far, where we actually... Oh focus in on those problems and, and try to solve them together. Yeah, because I, I would have thought there'd be some industries where they are governed by regu regulatory issues, like, for example, removalists, and then you've got people who would go out effectively hire a, a Europe car truck and, and, and try and be removalists on the weekend. Has that kind of thing been something you had to work your way through to make sure that you weren't at odds with regulations? Well, I think one of our values at Airtasker is to be fit for purpose. And uh, this is something that we carry through into our, um, our marketplace too, which is that it depends on what kind of job it is. So absolutely, when it comes to things like um, uh, nannies or babysitters, uh, we have working with children's checks that can be verified on the platform and you can uh, surface those. Uh, we have police uh, checks that you can check uh, on the platform. They're verified by, by us. So you can absolutely find people for that. But you can also find, for example, if you want someone to hand out flyers outside your chicken shop, you know, if you're trying to promote, you can also find people who might not have been through all of those different uh, steps, but you can find them faster um, through our platform. So uh, it's really about being fit for purpose for the job um, at hand. And what we always um, uh, prioritize is making sure that everybody has access to all of the education and information about what's safe and what's legal and, and what's not. Okay, so what's the outlook for the company, Tim? And be right, no, no guesses here, Pre precise accuracy, okay? Uh, the outlook for the coming year? Yeah. Uh, so we're definitely seeing that, um, you know, 
this first uh, part of the year has been affected by the COVID lockdowns. And I think that that is going to be something that continues to be the case, probably for the remainder of calendar year uh, 21. Uh, we see that as a very temporary um, adjustment. And, you know, we were pretty clear in our, um, in our um, update to the market that uh, in this first month, you know, in July of 2021, uh, we saw about a 12% uh, reduction in marketplace activity uh, for this period. But also that what we saw last year was the bounce back out of lockdowns um, is actually very, very rapid. And so we're actually expecting that there's not going to be any impact from, you know, um, the COVID lockdowns on the overall FY22 uh, uh, results. And we're expecting that to be, you know, um, more than $200 million uh, in GMV, which is really, really exciting. Uh, that's gross marketplace volume, the total turnover of the market. Um, and we're expecting to achieve at least $10 million in um, annual run rate of GMV in the US and the UK, which is the really exciting part for us. Yeah. Well, mate, good luck with it. Um, it's always great seeing uh, an entrepreneur go public and uh, expand worldwide, and we wish you a lot of luck. Peter, thanks for having me. Cheers. Become an annual Switzer Report subscriber and get unprecedented access to my seven investing principles where I reveal the exact strategies I use to invest. You'll get access to an exclusive PDF, video recording, and even a free copy of my book, Join the Rich Club. With a 30-day money-back guarantee, a Switzer Report subscription is one of the wisest investments you can make towards your future. Find out more at switzerreport.com.au slash YouTube offer or click on the link in the description below. We're listing on the Australian stock market. It happened on Wednesday this week. Um, yeah, today, yeah. What, what, what was the listing price? Well, I, before we started, it was about $1.85, but was that yeah. the price? Yeah, yeah. No, no, well, we didn't raise any money, so it was just a compliance listing for the market to work it out. Because yeah. um, we have about 800 shareholders, and uh, we just we were going to raise money. We didn't want to do it under two dollars a share because none of us wanted to dilute it under that, and we didn't need to. So we just said, look, let's just put it on and see where it goes, and at least people have got liquidity. And you're trading about a dollar eighty-five, I think, or well, that's where it opened anyway. Okay, so so the the big issues that are going to drive the profits of this business. I, I, I've got some numbers here. Correct me if I'm wrong. They whack my glasses on for this. Um, so in 2020, USA um, a loss of 8.1 million. Of course, you're starting there, I guess, uh, and you're expecting a half a million profit this year. These are the sort of numbers yeah. you come up with. And yep. locally, yeah. locally, I thought the local numbers are interesting. That you have 4.5 million loss in 2020, but you're looking at a 73.2 million gain in 2021. Is that right? Yep. Okay. Yep. So, what, what explained that? Was it coronavirus? What were the, the reasons why? No. Nah. So, the, the, there's a number of things at play. Firstly, is that we have pulled out a huge amount of groves and replanted um, over the last um, 10 years, but particularly over the last five years. And we've done that because we've got all the research on which varieties work in Australia to, to have the lowest cost of production and the highest quality. And we've ruthlessly pulled them out, which has meant that we've been, you don't get anything from them when you pull them out until the new tree grows. So we've got a lot of young trees, we've got a lot less, less mature hectares. But we also, the because of the drought, we had a $20.5 million water bill um, in FY20. And all of us are biannual bearers. And that means that they have a low crop one year followed by a high crop the next. And that's naturally occurring and it doesn't bother us very much because we manage our whole business over a two year cycle of that crop. So if you wanna look at your real cost of production in olives, you have to go two years where the cost, two years where the production, that's your cost of production because your costs are pretty fixed. When you have a low crop, your cost of production's here. And when you have a really high crop, it's down here. And our, our cash flow, our sales to the customers are very stable and consistent, but, and we also have to bring to account in the year of harvest, the oil that we harvested from our trees at what we're going to sell it at, but we don't bring any other oil that we've got, you know, that we've bought from other growers or anything else has to stay there at cost. So it's so effectively our profits, and I've got this in the prospectus and, and, and we made an announcement today about looking at two year rolling average reported numbers, because the reported numbers are 
non-cash adjustments that work out to be right, but over two years work out to be right, not over one. When you when you look at it objectively, of course, the statutory accounts are the statutory accounts, but um, we we like to say, okay, we have a at the this year now uh, combined last year and this year of the Australian business, and obviously we break even, make money in in the US and our value add business as well as is getting to that point as well but if you look at our Australian olive oil business which is the heart of drives our earnings we'll have about a 42 million dollar EBITDA average between that last year loss that you're talking about and this year yeah. and yeah. after this coming harvest so in the one we're in now that'll should have another material jump so and that and we've got the cost of running all of our groves but only about 60 percent are really producing but we've got the cost of all of them. So most of the revenue increase will also flow to profit as we go forward in the Australian business. Okay. How, how big a threat is drought to the business? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a fairly serious um, earnings or cash flow um, hit or... Uh, so it works both ways. When it's average rainfall above water prices get very, very cheap because there's lots around. And when the drier it gets, the higher they get. So our water bill can go between, you know, $3 million and $20 million based on the drought. What we have got going for us is that olives are probably the only mainstream crop because they're like the mallee tree or the eucalypts of the Mediterranean that will survive um, if you don't water them. Whereas we're in a dry climate, if we didn't have any water all year, our trees wouldn't die. Yes, we wouldn't get a crop, but we got our asset. If that was almonds or citrus or wine grapes, table grapes, they're going to die if you don't water them because they're not a hardy plant, if that makes sense. So I, I never say that we, um, you know, aren't going to be impacted. Of course we are if it's if, if financially, but we've never, ever had trouble buying water. It's just how much you pay. And we can pay more, I believe, than any other mainstream crop because of, and we don't have the currency risk that's a much currency risk in the Australian business and, and almost no commodity risk either, which which is a good place to be because most times in ag, when you've got a drought, your commodity is also on the floor or something else goes wrong. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's the, 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 the life of a farmer. But tell us this, mate, your innovation into the other brand, Wellgrow, what, what does that include? And is, is it a, a potentially more stable business or, or is it a, a potentially faster grower? Yeah, I, I think it's, it, look, I, personally, I'm really excited about it. Um, we're not saying a lot. We've spent $20 million over the last seven years. We've got a whole suite of new products coming on. Um, and to put it really simply, those antioxidants that I'm talking about are the value in the health for olive oil. Naturally, when you crush the olives and spin the oil out, only about 1% of those antioxidants in total end up in the oil, which give it this flavour, smell, health benefits. The other 99% end up in the waste stream and end up dying and we compost it and put it back on. Well, we've worked out how to get those antioxidants out of the fruit alive and, and, into, and freeze dry them into a powder. And that's been part of this really big research. And there's a number of other and there's antioxidants from the leaves. I mean, that's a me too type product. Other people do that. But we're really excited about not just the well grow bit, but being a pretty major supplier to um, supplement company, companies of some pretty important antioxidants that are um, reasonably rare because a lot, most, not a lot of people in the world crush fresh olives. That's the reality. Only 25% of the world's production is even extra virgin and hardly anyone's got our scale of that as well. So the, we're excited about it, but it's certainly, I'll say, higher risk, but probably definitely a lot more stable and potentially, um, yeah, I, I think it's potentially bigger than the business. But again, I'm not saying that out loud, even though I just did, but, but, but it might not be. But even, even, if it's, even if we get all of that as our zero waste initiative and we make modest profits, at least our waste stream is not costing us money to cart away you know, the, the leftovers and we're using, we're getting more out of the water, the fertiliser, you know, everything else. You know, and one of the things I'm really proud of in our business is that we, we've got this olive IQ system that's just proprietary to us in how you grow olives. We get nine times the yields of the global average, you know, using 37% less water per litre than the average, you know, I think 40 or 50% less nitrogen, 80% less phosphorus, 
per litre of olive oil produced. And we offset the carbon of a small city like Bendigo each year just because of our, our groves and, and how productive they are. And um, it, it's, it, it's sort of just a really cool business, if that makes sense, with so many things that, you know, seem to just create opportunities. So, yeah, we're, we're excited in case you can't. Yeah, yeah. Rob, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great enthusiasm and I think uh, anyone who's thinking about investing in a company they understand there's always risk investing in any companies but it's a really good story and I think as an Aussie uh, and others like me really hope you kick some massive goals both here and abroad and uh, it's really nice to meet you thanks for coming on the program oh, thanks so much Peter really appreciate you having us and, and the support of the Australian consumer and and hopefully they'll become shareholders is, is, you know, really humbling. And we're so, so want to keep this company Australian. Great stuff. Thanks for joining us, mate. No worries. Thanks, Peter. Well, joining us now for our regular catch-up is Marcus Bogdan, who is the portfolio manager of the Switzer Dividend Growth Fund. And because he's an expert on dividend paying stocks, I like to occasionally catch up with him and see what's going on. And of course, in reporting season, a lot's going on. Marcus, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Peter. Good to be here. Mate, can I, uh, let's talk about some of the, the releases so far. We saw a big one yesterday with the CBA, a couple of big ones this morning. So let's start with the CBA first of all. Uh, the dividend, that make you smile as a dividend collector? Absolutely. Um, and it was ahead, both the earnings and the, and the dividend were ahead of market expectations. Uh, and that reflects the underlying strength of the CBA franchise, where they're delivering above system growth, both in home loans and business and, and very strong uh, deposit growth as well. So it was a, it was a premium result. Uh, dividend was $2 plus a $6 billion buyback. Uh, and given the strength of the capital position of CBA, uh, the expectation is that there'll be further uh, buybacks going, going forward. Yeah. So does the buyback directly affect the fund or only indirectly in the sense that the share price could be affected? Well, it affects the share count um, and so the number of shares that are issued by, by C CBA, that share count will be reduced to around 4 or 5 per cent uh, and that will, be, that will certainly benefit the earnings growth uh, for, for CB CBA go going forward. So it's a net positive for our investors. Okay. Um, today we also got news from Telstra. And Telstra clearly is in the fund, being a big dividend payer. Yes, What's yeah. the story there? Well, importantly, they maintain the eight cents dividend, and they also an announced a one point five billion dollar buyback, and that was from from the proceeds from the from the sale of their mobile towers business, mm -hmm. and for the first time in many years, that operationally you are starting to see some improvements there, uh, good strength there in the mobile biz business. Uh, and also very strong cash generation from the business, which underpins that, that dividend yield there of around 4.2% fully franked. Yeah, so at the moment, Telstra has been a great disappointer, but yes. at the moment you're getting, you're getting stock price growth and you're getting uh, a solid dividend. So it's... Um, an overdue win-win situation with Telstra for you guys. Absolutely. It's probably looking the best it has looked for a, no, a number of years. I mean, there's still challenges in that marketplace, but I think as an industry, there's much more rationality in the mobile players. Uh, and Telstra now are very, very focused on, uh, on capital management and returns to shareholders, which is uh, encouraging. Now, Goodman Group is not renowned for its dividend paying history, but you do have it in the, in the fund and it did report pretty well today. It, it, it did. It's probably in the best position in terms of where real estate is. Uh, they are in, they're a global leader in, in warehousing and in logistics. And so they're a, a real beneficiary of digitalization and this real push 
to, to online. Mm. Uh, and so they're delivering earnings per share growth of 10% plus per annum. Uh, they do pay a dividend to, to shareholders. Uh, and why we do like them is that they're absolutely in a sweet spot in terms of the new economy. Uh, they've got a very, very strong balance sheet and they're a global leader uh, in logistic warehousing. Yeah, but its function in the fund, the Switzer Dividend Growth Fund, is more for its growth than for its dividend. Yes, so and the, obviously the growth underpins the, div, the, the dividend going going forward as well, which is, uh, you know, those two things are always very strong, strongly linked. Yeah, some people might understand, but you, you can sell a stock that has had fantastic capital growth to enhance the dividend that you pay to um, the unit holders. Indeed, you can, yes. Yeah, okay. So people watching this might be thinking, well, when does the Switzer Dividend Growth Fund pay out next time? Because clearly we're going through a period of great dividends, better than, even though I know you're, you're a brilliant crystal ball gazer when it comes to what companies will pay. This is like, a, you wouldn't have thought this a year ago that, we, that the dividends would be so good, and they are going to be good. When does the Switzer Dividend Growth Fund actually pay the, its next dividend? Yeah, I mean, you make a, a really important point because both earnings and dividends have been substantially better than where we would have thought a year ago. Uh, and we're seeing earnings growth of 25% plus expected for this results period. And that will be reflected in the dividend growth as well. Uh, and then for the investors, uh, they get their dividends paid on a quarterly basis uh, so the next next payment for the dividends will be on the 30th of September. Okay. Well, <clears throat> when we, we created this fund, it was meant to be like a very safe, secure type of, albeit in the stock market type fund. And of course, the coronavirus took the share price or the unit price down pretty quickly. But I'm really happy that it's rebounded to the all-time high of $2.77 today. That's good to see. <laughs> Absolutely. And it's also important to note that in the, in the portfolio, the composition around quality companies that have been very resilient earners, and that resilience and earnings is so important in maintaining and growing dividends. And so investors will be well aware of companies like uh, West Farmers and um, Brambles and Woolworths and Coles that, that have been able to maintain in their, and grow their dividends even throughout the COVID period. Yeah, exactly right. Marcus, thanks for joining us. Talk to you in a few weeks time. Thanks, pleasure, Peter. Become an annual Switzer Report subscriber and get unprecedented access to my seven investing principles where I reveal the exact strategies I use to invest. You'll get access to an exclusive PDF, video recording, and even a free copy of my book, Join the Rich Club. With a 30-day money-back guarantee, a Switzer Report subscription is one of the wisest investments you can make towards your future. Find out more at switzerreport.com.au slash YouTube offer or click on the link in the description below. Joining us now is a founder of Century 21, Charles Tarby. And we want to get a feel of what's going on in the property market right now. Charles, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Peter. You can see I'm in lockdown at the moment. It's nice to see you dressed up for lockdown. Yeah, I always dress up for important people like you, Charles. Now, look, <laughs> yeah. Let's Likewise. Cut, let's cut <laughs> the chase. I've seen some, I know, you, you actually said to me, you thought that the, the market was going to start to slow down, not slow down excessively, but slow down from the, the boom we've been seeing. But I've been reading stories about places coming in, selling 1.5 million over reserve and whatever. Are, are these stories telling the truth of the overall market or are they sort of one-off special properties and special suburbs? Look, there's no doubt there's still a shortage of stock out there, but the average clearance rates have dropped from the early 90s at the start of this year, and they've been averaging the mid-70s for the last eight weeks. So there's definitely a change, Peter. Uh, the, some of these properties that are coming up for sale uh, are properties generally with, when they're selling way over reserve. There's just not a lot of stock available. And now with COVID lockdowns in, in, in just about every part of the country, the majority of vendors have started to withdraw their properties for sale because they don't want people through. So you've still got the same amount of interest from buyers, but an even lower amount of stock. I mean, you had 640 properties uh, 
uh, last year go to auction uh, in Sydney and the 576 last weekend. Now, you might think that, that uh, you know, that's all almost, almost on par, but with the amount of, of stock that we know is floating behind what's sitting there right now, we should be sitting at eight, 900 properties for auction in Sydney, Melbourne, et cetera, et cetera. And that hasn't happened. Has the lockdown stopped the supply of properties to Charles? Yeah. Other oh, oh, heaven, yes. Heavens, yes. As, as, I, as I said, uh, you know, people are just frightened. Uh, they don't want people coming through their home. Uh, there are restrictions with that anyway. It's just become incredibly difficult. I had a property that was going to auction. Uh, just, just as the lockdown started, we were probably two weeks away, and I made the decision just to push it back a bit to see what might happen and when we could see a full lockdown. That might, the property I had for sale required people to travel from all parts of Sydney up to the Blue Mountains to see this property, you know, a commercial property in the heart of Lura. And I just realised at that point in time, I just wasn't going to get the interest. So I'm one of those people that took my property off the market. Yeah, okay. So that's the current situation. Now, does this mean then that, for example, let's assume that by um, October, November, uh, the vaccination rates are really good. And so as a consequence, people are actually more confident are we going to see, a, do you believe, a, a big run, rush of property onto the market? And my, my follow-up question is, should people try and sell now or wait till spring? Yeah. Um, after the last couple of lockdowns, we go back into the early days, we had a massive upswing and it's exactly what happened. A lot of property came on and it started to fill the buyer supply that, that was out there. Um, my son has uh, asked me about his investment property. He's thinking about selling it and he's talking to me. And I said, you know what, Joe, I think it's a good time. And uh, he wanted to know why. I said, there's hardly anybody on the market or in the market. Your, your competition levels are really low. And I have to say to you, Peter, in a very short amount of time, what we thought he was going to sell his property for, he is sitting at, at $175,000 already above what the agent's first price was. And it's a private treaty, it's a vacant home, so they can run people through it. And the amount of inquiry just on that one property has been extraordinary. So I'd have to say to you that uh, if you wanted to sell, now's a very good time if you can get people through. So supply is a problem, but the buyers are overcoming the lockdown barriers? Well, some of them can. Uh, you know, the, you've got the auction rules where people can, can buy online. Some people have already seen properties, you know, four or five weeks ago before the serious lockdowns came in. Uh, so I, I think it's going to get a little bit harder if we're still in lockdown and you can't go out and see property. I mean, we've heard about that chappie that went all the way to Byron Bay and has caused all sorts of issues. That has opened up a can of worms. The fact that that person could go through a home and, and, and now spread the virus everywhere. So I think that the agent's going to be in for a little bit more of a tougher time okay. in trying to demonstrate property. Okay, so um, trying to march into 2022 then, what do you think is going to happen, Charles, when, when, like, I'm arguing for the economy, there's going to be a big rebound once we're all vaccinated and all of a sudden we can fly to, to Queensland and maybe New Zealand or even overseas by the middle of the year. Are you expecting that kind of thing to lead to A, plenty of buyers because jobs will be coming back uh, and then supply will be coming online because it's a more normal market. What do you think is going to happen in 2022? Yeah, I, I do. I still think that that slowdown, I, you know, I saw the ANZ Bank announce that they, they thought property prices would drive 20, up to 24% in the next year. Uh, you know, as you know, in May last year, ComBank said they'd go down 32% and then come up 9% in November. So it's, it's a bit all over the place. You don't know really who to listen to. So I can only say to you that the feeling out in the marketplace is that we're reaching that point where affordability is becoming a big issue. Uh, valuers are starting to get a little bit gun shy because they don't really know these valuers are rising so values are rising so quickly. And I was talking to our New Zealand counterparts this morning and they flat chat because they, they are out of lockdown mm -hmm. and their biggest issue is shortage of stock still. Uh, and when I looked at the median price of a property in Auckland, it was just a few thousand dollars below that of Sydney. So I, I think I think we've reached that point where affordability is is going to drive a lot of people away from the market. Not the desire, the affordability. Okay, let's just talk about one aspect of your business. Like you're known for Century Twenty One or C Twenty One, which is your your modern 
um, yeah. take the business. But you've also got another arm to your business. Why don't you tell us about that? Uh, okay, thanks, Peter. Yeah, look, I bought the rights for Australia and New Zealand for Better Homes and Gardens Real Estate. Uh, it's already a, a well-established brand in the US, Canada, and uh, the, because it's such a big brand in this country, uh, what Realogy, the US parent, tried to do was to connect the dots. I mean, Better Homes and Gardens does everything around the home, inside the home, outside the home, except sell the home. And so we created a, a, a brand presence with Better Homes and Gardens Real Estate, uh, utilising the Better Homes and Gardens magazine as well, which is part of our, our uh, uh, marketing strategy, also on the Better Homes and Gardens Real Estate website. And so what it's done is it's brought a sort of a, a boutique franchise, if you like, into the marketplace. So, I mean, you have other organisations that are associated with magazines, but they're just associated with the front cover. They're not an integrated part of the magazine, of the website, and, and part of the, the magazine subscription. And, and of course, the Better Homes and Gardens brand itself, uh, who doesn't know that brand and who doesn't trust that brand? And so we build a marketing strategy to that level. And uh, we've opened now uh, 14 offices um, uh, down the East Coast. And uh, those offices have been very well received by the community. Uh, because the community straight away accept that Better Homes and Gardens, uh, Better Homes and Gardens Real Estate is a trusted, well-known brand. How many do you think you'll have over time? I didn't want to do the same as what I've done with Century 21. Um, uh, this is, uh, as I said, it's more boutique -y. I would like to see about 100 offices down the eastern seaboard. We've, there's already, we've already opened in Adelaide as well, in North Adelaide. So what I'm trying to do is to create hubs. So... For instance, the office in Caloundra uh, has had an, in, an enormous year. They were, they were an established uh, independent agent. They've opened their second agency already within the first year. And I've encouraged them to open another four or five satellites so that they can take a broader area rather than have, uh, you know, six or seven offices, have one dominant office with a number of arms to it. And that's really what I want to set up. Okay. And has lockdown, coronavirus and all that sort of stuff. Uh, Made, made it a, a challenging business. In it, it, it has. I would have liked to have, have, have opened 30 offices by now, Peter, but boy, oh boy, you know, you can't get out. We're, there's a lot of people talking to us, no doubt. We're doing Zoom meetings left, right and centre or Google Hangouts left, right and centre with prospective uh, franchisees. But heaven help us. I mean, it, C21 has had a renewal and a new office every week since the start of the year. Every Tuesday, we've announced either a new office or a renewal. So it's, it's uh, reviving really quite strongly. But we just can't get out there face to face, which when you're trying to commit somebody to a, a, a document for a number of years, it's, it's not something you can easily do uh, via Zoom or over the telephone. Yeah. Charles Tarby, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Peter. And that was Charles Tarby of Century 21. Before I go, a lot of the stocks we talk about here in this show are analysed in much more detail in the Switzer Report. So if you are interested in investing and making money out of going to the stock market, think about at least trying a free trial of the Switzer Report. You will get ideas, many ideas, that we don't cover in the show. So go to switzerreport.com.au. And as I always say, if anything's worth doing, it's worth doing for money. I'm Peter Switzer. Thanks for joining me. See you on Monday.